All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Epinic e-learning web class. We will be discussing about IPv4 to IPv6 transition. Okay. So, in IPv4 to IPv6 transition, what we will be discussing is uh, how we can migrate our network from the legacy IPv4 protocol to the latest IPv6 protocol. Okay. As you all know, uh, the current internet that we are using now are built on IP version 4 protocol and that uh, building process has been started uh, since early 80s okay so during that time when ipv4 protocol was used uh, it was not sort of uh, build or develop considering the current scope of the internet so obviously in ipv4 protocol there were some limitations right even though ipv4 as a protocol is very very successful but still when the protocol was developed, uh, the perce perception of that protocol, like you know, in an environment where the protocol will be used, was not anticipated as the current internet we have now, massive, very big. Okay, so compared to that uh, growth, V4 protocol has got some uh, limitation. For example, one of the very uh, visible one is the available address space. And there are some other limitations in terms of the functionalities of the v4 protocol so comparing all those uh, uh, limitations of v4 protocol uh, the internet community especially the scientists they have developed a new protocol which is ip version 6 okay if you see as a protocol ip version 4 and ip version 6 they are not backward forward compatible they are completely two different protocol right and there are so many uh, reason behind that uh, and the objective of the presentation today is not to discuss of all those functional aspect of it but to discuss about how we can transition how we can migrate okay so what I was discussing, uh, these two protocol, IP version 4 and IP version 6, are not backward forward compatible. It means those are two different language, two different protocol. It's like I speak in English and you speak in French. Two different protocol, two different language we are speaking. So if source and destination, they keep speaking in two different language, what we can communicate? Probably nothing other than garbage, right? So the same thing, same idea that we have in internet now. The current internet that we have built already based on a language, based on a protocol or a communication protocol, which is IP version 4, right? So if you are running a laptop and from that laptop, if you are browsing a website, for example, www.apnic.net, right? Using IPv4 protocol, your machine as a client of the internet and the servers in APNIC uh, probably machine room or APNIC data center, right, speaking in the same language in IP version 4, so that your machine can communicate with the server and get all those data, right? It's possible in IPv4. But if your machine you are running on IP version 6 protocol, it means in a different language than the servers in APNIC data center what it can communicate, then what you can communicate in between? Nothing, probably you can't even create a session with the APN web server, right? So that is the reality. V4 and V6 are two different protocol. Now the question comes, okay, so the future internet that we are or we will be building on a scalable IP version 6 protocol, then how we do the migration? Right? Because we cannot do the migration just overnight in a single click. It will take a time because as a scope of the work for the migration is very, very massive. Right? 
and to do that massive migration we can't just do it in overnight we we have to have sort of a time duration probably a longer time i don't know probably it can be two years three years four years ten years down the line right then slowly slowly people can migrate from v4 to v6 so during this migration period if you build any machine probably considering the future protocol of ipv6 you build it on ipv6 only then the question comes okay if you build that machine on ipv6 only what about the legacy machines who are running on ip version 4 only can you communicate probably not then what will be the strategy so that during this migration period both the machine who are speaking in two different language they can communicate that's what we'll be discussing now okay all right <coughs> let's move on so before we start uh, or getting into more detail about the migration uh, this is my introduction my name is Nurul Islam Roman uh, I am currently the senior training specialist now in APNIC I have joined in APNIC in 2006 as a host master and initially I used to uh, deal with uh, IP and AS number requests from our members and then afterward I move into our learning and development team. So on the slide I have outlined some of my uh, uh, interesting, interesting areas for example routing switching IPv6 DNS and resource management and so on. So if you have any question in context you feel free to uh, ask those questions to me I will try to answer your question and as I have mentioned to ask question you can use the chat box okay just write your question on the chat box i'll keep my eye on on the chat box so as soon as i have got your question i'll try to answer your question as quickly as i can after we finish the presentation today uh, i'll show you an url from that url uh, you can give us feedback about the presentation that we did your feedback is very important for us because based on your feedback we will try to improve our future e-learning session okay and then uh, last but not the least acknowledgement to Cisco systems because they are the market leader one of the market leader anyway so we, we sort of use their uh, resources their materials actually to develop this presentation okay so let's move on so what are those overview for today? We will try to sort of uh, clarify the concept of transition from V4 to V6. What does it mean really, right? What does it mean by transition? What are the concepts? Then uh, how V4 and V6 they can coexist together, right? Up until certain time because as we can see, uh, from the protocol point of view we had a protocol which is IP version 4 and we will have a new protocol which is IP version 6 at one point of time like in future I don't know when in future but at some point of time probably we will be face out the old protocol and we'll have a new protocol which is which will be dominating the internet at, at, at one point of time right so <coughs> During that uh, transition period, how V4 and V6 can coexist, that we will be discussing as well. Then dual stack. Dual stack is one of the transition technique that is very popular. A dual stack means uh, our machine can be able to communicate in both language, both V4 and V6. The way I, sp I probably can speak in both French and English. So if, it, if I can speak both French and English, then I'll not have any issue to communicate with the French speaking people or in an English speaking environment, right? That's easy for me. So that's what I am, dual stack. So that we'll be discussing as well. Then we'll see some challenges in dual stack because dual stack looks very good, sounds very good, but some, some scenarios, it might have some, some challenges, right? For example, to learn uh, two different languages, we have to put some effort there has to be some some initiative like some cost involves some challenges as well so those we will be discussing then we will see another 
uh, popular approach which is tunneling right so what does tunneling means and how tunneling can help us to sort of send the six packet through v4 network right and uh, we discuss about six to four uh, transition technologies and six rd right those are the transition technologies used nowadays there are some other transition technologies very recently but all are based on the tunneling concept right so tunneling is a concept that we need to understand if we can understand the concept of tunneling then probably we can look into all those latest transition technologies and some of the transition technologies if you can classify them group them uh, majority of transition technologies that we can see uh, today sort of useful transition technologies I would say based on tunneling right but in a different different way right? in a scalable way then we will try to see some strategies that we can use when you do the transition planning okay so transition overviews as i said how you can get connectivity from a v6 host to the global internet right you can get a connectivity via native v6 connectivity or via v6 in v4 tunnel technique that is what sort of a very generic uh, concept the purpose of v6 is or v6 protocol is to give enough flexibility for the future internet to grow one limitation of the growth of future internet is we don't have enough address right so to resolve this problem we have a new protocol called v6 that can give us more addresses right and keep in keep in our mind when we build future internet we are not going to get into the netting anymore so in future internet that we are trying to build is end-to-end -end connectivity because if we don't have end-to-end -end connectivity we cannot take internet up to further extent for example smart home everything every household device will be connected to the internet how you can do that if we don't have end-to-end -end connectivity right if i if my fridge is connected to the internet and if i would like to see how much juice or even milk or eggs that i have in the fridge from a mobile apps when i'm in the shopping center right how you can do that by doing end-to-end -end connectivity from my mobile apps to the fridge right so that's why we need end-to-end -end connectivity so we can't use any that so when we need end-to-end -end connectivity every devices need addresses and some sort of functionalities as well for future uh, application requirement to get those sort of uh, flexibility for the internet growth we build new machine on v6 protocol so when we build new machine on v6 protocol then how we connect with the other machine as a destination if the other machine as a destination are running on v6 protocol then we can connect on natively right from v6 to v6 connectivity so when that data traffic from source to destination is going by the infrastructure network on the infrastructure network not necessarily you will always have v6 as a transport right you can have v4 as a transport what is or which is most likely case at this stage okay so then we need to have some sort of tunneling approach through the v4 infrastructure how we can send the traffic that i have created on the client machine can go via the v4 infrastructure through a tunnel right that's what we call v6 in v4 tunnel technique all right so v6 only deployments that that probably a case in future and not probably very near future right probably in future is very rare right so so in practical reality what we are doing now when we build new network nowadays we prefer to build on dual stack right that's much easier so a dual stack means we install both v4 and v6 as a protocol on the machine so when we have both v4 and v6 as a protocol on the machine not only the client machines or the end system devices 
but also on the intermediate system devices for example our routers who carry the traffic if we can do that then probably it depending on the applications they will check what transport is available if before transport is available all the way from source to destination they, they will prefer to use v6 as a transport if any point along the path v6 transport is broken then it can fall back into v4 as a transport because the source machine has got both the capability for v4 and v6 that's what we call dual stack okay so about all those transition technologies depending on different different scenarios so for example what could be the transition technologies in ip core network what could be the transition technologies in the data center network what could be the transition technologies in lte 3g network mobile network or dsl network right or ymax so all those different different transition technologies uh, are actually developed in ietf so in ietf there are three working groups working on it uh, if i would like to take the names for example v6 ops right they are one of the working group they actually define the process what process can be involved to transit your network or migrate your network from v4 to v6 the second group is behave so they actually work on different scenarios right so what could be the transition technologies in mobile network scenarios or in, in WiMAX network scenario or in DSL network scenarios, right? And then Softree's working group, the last one, what they does or what they do, they actually uh, deal with the nitty gritty control function, signaling and software coding and all sort of things are being developed in Softree's working group. So if you are interested of any of those uh, special group, Go and subscribe to the mailing list uh, the list uh, sort of URL is there on the slide as I said uh, towards the end of the presentation this uh, slide will be shared with you so you don't need to sort of uh, take note of all those URL just you know follow the presentation and towards the end this slide will be shared so you can get all those as a reference okay so let's move on and see the scenarios so for example this is what if we can uh, simplify the current internet as this say so for example uh, if we consider the current internet as this one right and in the current internet if you see all those computers around we call those end system devices right like our servers our laptops and those end system devices are connected across via routers right those are the routers like uh, as you are all familiar with this uh, design symbols so if any machine create a packet so if you see this internet now all are running on v4 right so this is what uh, the black shed uh, represent v4 internet so any machine on the network if you install the latest operating system on the edge here so for example windows vista windows uh, 8 recently right so then even though you don't know those operating system has got support for v6 both v4 and v6 that's what we call dual stack by default right and on that machine if you create any packet right so for example this packet from from uh, this machine a6 that will go to uh, other machine called v6 on the other side of the network that will go to the other side of the network so that packet when you create here packet source is a6 packet destination is b6 right so this packet when it comes from the machine and on the gateway for example the router here what the router will do by default the router will not understand what the packet is because the router by default only understand IPv4 as a protocol. Did you see the black circle? It means IPv4 as a protocol. So when the packet comes to the router 
and router doesn't understand what the packet is, he'll just discard it, right? That's how we don't have any transport from source to destination in V6, right? Then the machine will go back to IPv4. Now what we need to do in, in this situation, right? We need to make sure the transport here along the path, all the routers understand V6. We need to make them understand V6 as a protocol. So this is how probably these routers, they become dual stack. When this router become dual stack, then the router, when the packet comes here, the router will understand what the packet is, right? And he will try to see the routing table and try to determine who would be the next stop. But here you'll see he can't find any next stop because both the routers connected to this router doesn't support IPv6, okay? Then our transport is broken in this part now. Little bit better than before, at least like, you know, our default gateway understand basic packet. Now as our objective on the other side, if you see network, their router is also V6 supported. So two side of the network, they are V6 supported, but in the middle, the infrastructure doesn't support V6. What we can do? Do we need to wait for them, the people in the middle or the routers in the middle to be V6 supported? How far we can wait, right? So that's why there is a technology in place called tunneling. In tunneling, how you can do that? So from here to there, we can create a tunnel, right? And what does the tunneling mean? Tunneling means this router are one v4. This router can create an encapsulation on top of v6 packet. What is that? The v6 packet that it received from his client he will add one more header on top of it and the header type is obviously ipv4 type header right or ipv4 version header if that header comes here now v6 packet the whole v6 packet including the headers and payload are going inside v4 right and then from here this router will send the packet to the next stop now when this router will create the v4 header what it need to do, it need to specify the source of the tunnel, which is obviously this router, and then you have to specify the destination of the tunnel, which is obviously the other side of the network. So this router need to know who will be the source and who will be the destination. And this is, this is how the administrator need to create the one side of the tunnel, right? Then on the other side of the tunnel, same way, the other side administrator need to create their side of the tunnel. On their side, what they will specify, they will specify themselves as a source and this router as a destination. When this configuration is done from the both side, then when the packet comes to this router, right, from this router all the, all the way up to the other router, routing will be happening based on only this black header, which is IPv4 header. Make sense? That's what we call tunneling. So during the transition period, right, when all the routers, all the servers, all the clients in our networks are not V6 supported, right? We can use the tunneling technique. And, and at one point, when every device, as you can see on the slide, are V6 supported because they have got a green circle right here, then probably we don't need V4 anymore because everyone can speak in IPv6. So then we'll see slowly, slowly V4 will be phased out from the network or from the internet, right? And as I said, I don't know when that things will be possible, right? It, it could be, I don't know, probably in five years, 10 years, 15 years, or even 20 years down the line, I'm not sure, right? It depending on how quickly people can uh, sort of uh, adopt with IP version 6 protocol and they can do the migration as quickly as they can. All right, so as I said, so no fixed day. When we can convert, I don't know. So millions of IPv4 node already exist. That's that is the complication. Millions of IPv4 node already exist. We need to upgrade them to support IPv6, right? And you can't do it just in one night. And it will take some period of, of some time. So if you see all those transition technologies, right? Those can be classified in three category number one is obviously dual stack which is the popular one 
then tunneling technique as I, as I have already explained how the tunneling works that is what the basic operation of tunnel right in different different technology those tunnel source and destination can be derived or can be specified differently and then we can see the translation technique translation means uh, my client will speak in IPv6 and the server side probably speak in IPv4 someone in the middle they need to translate right so if you see all those approach uh, <coughs> probably the ideal approach is dual stack right and if you have some challenges then you can go for tunneling and translation translation is less preferred according to my realization because if you if we keep translating right all the time then neither the source or destination they will learn the new language right so what is the objective in future probably we will try to convert everything in v6 and if you keep doing translation all the time then no one will learn ipv6 no one will learn ipv6 right so our objective will not be achieved probably right so if we have a plan for future like at one point of time we will try to learn language then probably we can use translation up to certain time okay any questions so far okay so so dual stack if we use dual stack what could be the approach well if we use dual stack on your machine it's not the administrator headache it's not the administrator responsibility to make to sort of determine which transport can be used because it has got dual stack anyway that will be determined by the application what application we are using on the machine right so for example if you am browsing and and depending on the browser version right they will prefer the transport if they can realize from source to destination we have a sort of a healthy v6 transport right we can use it otherwise we can go back to ipv4 that's what we call happy eyeball right so new operating system like mac uh, windows they use that happy eyeball right which transport is the healthiest transport better transport they will use it by default okay dual stack challenges there are some challenges in dual stack as well for example compatible software do we have a compatible software to use dual stack so for example in our machine uh, not necessarily depending on the operating system because operating system should have uh, tcp ip support for ipv6 then obviously what applications we are running on top of the uh, operating system so for example is that a web server is that a mail server right depending on that what mail application we are using as a server what web application we are using as a server is it apache is it iis right or is it send mail those server software need to have v6 support as well right <clears throat> then when it goes to the infrastructure side right for the routing purpose as well uh, the routing protocol need to have that application i mean you know protocol support if you're using Westphia version 2, as we know, Westphia version 2 can only carry IPv4 protocol, right? We need to have the equivalent compatible software for IPv6, probably Westphia version 3. If you use ISIS with certain extension, they can support both IPv4 and IPv6. Then it also depends on transparent availability of services, deployment of servers, and so many factors that we have that you know can create a challenge. It could be like you know in your OSS, like if you're a service provider, if you're running a service provider network, right? Not only the applications, but also uh, uh, the OSS that you are using for your billing, for your account accounting, right? The software that you are using need to have basic support as well, because sometimes those OSS software they try to read IP header. And when they read IP header and do all those billing accountability based on IP address, then yes, there is a challenge. Traffic monitoring. If you if you try to monitor the traffic, right, based on the IP address, yes, there is a challenge. And obviously, the end user support. If we are using uh, IPv6 on the end user side and they call up on the help decks, lots of connectivity issues that are happening. Well, your help desk support need to have that knowledge how to handle ipv6 issues so there are so many challenges that we have in dual stack some more challenges that we have 
in the wireless environment where we are using RF to carry the signal, right? And if you're running a dual stack, so the very sort of uh, limited radio signals are the signal levels based on that uh, modulation technique we are using. In a dual stack environment, which is we call thick client, so to carry huge data, unnecessary data on the radio signals, the expensive RF or the frequency probably cannot be optimized because if we are running dual stack on a mobile device unnecessarily for the control, the RF need to carry loss of signals, redundant signals for both V4 and V6. That's a wastage of frequency. In that environment, probably they, they prefer on the mobile devices only one application or one protocol, either V4 or V6, not dual stack. Makes sense? Those are the challenges that we have. So dual stack approach and DNS. So DNS will play obviously a key role in the transport selection. So for example, on your machine, when you browse a website, for example, www.apnic.net, then your client per installed on your machine, we call it a resolver, talk to the local DNS. And when you talk to the local DNS, and from the local DNS, it try to get the address record for that website. And if your client application, for example, browser asking for a QWERTY record from the DNS server, QWERTY, it means 4A record from the DNS server, which means that machine actually requesting for IPv6 address, right? So if your DNS server knows how to get V6 address for that website and return it back to the client machine, then client machine can create a direct session with that web server on V6 transport, right? If your DNS cannot, then straight away your machine will fall back to IPv4. So DNS obviously has got a key role in selecting your transport, whether it, is, it will be V6 or it will be V4. Make sense? So that's what I explained in this slide. So from the client machine, the query comes in the DNS local DNS server. And from local DNS server, it will go and uh, if you can, it can return that QWERTY address, then it can go and create a session directly with the web server. Okay. So that's a uh, detailed query. So in DNS query, the machine uh, will go to the DNS server, will ask for QWERTY record. If the QWERTY record is there, then it will return a QWERTY record. So not necessarily the destination website IPv6 address will be in the DNS server always. If the DNS server is not authorized, right, it will go and talk to the root and from the root it will go to the authorized DNS server and from the authorized DNS server, this local DNS server can get the query result back, right. And then it can keep that into the cache for a certain time. If it doesn't uh, get IPv6 address for the website, then it can send a non-existent message. When it comes the non-existing message, a non-existence message, then it will ask for a A record or for an A record. So then it will create a session using IPv4 address. So that's what uh, the functionality of a DNS. So now if we see a configuration, dual stack configuration, how does it look? Well, uh, on an IP on an uh, IPv4 and IPv6 supported routers, what we can do? This is what Cisco routers configuration. We are configuring both IPv4 address like this and IPv6 address like this on the same interface. On the same interface, we are configuring both IPv4 and IPv6 so that this router interface, that particular interface, which is Ethernet zero will be supporting both V4 and V6 as a protocol, okay? All right, now we'll discuss about tunneling. So the example that I showed you here on a router only, so you can configure same dual stack configuration on a server and based on different, different operating system, the command line can be different. But the concept is a single interface will have both the protocol v4 and v6 as an example we only show you a cisco command 
So now we'll go to uh, tunneling. So if you see the approach tunneling, as I have already explained, tunneling mean, means your V6 packet will be as it is. On top of V6 packet, a device who will be the tunnel source in most likely case, they will add a header on top of it, which is IPv4 header. So when we add IPv4 header on top of IPv6, then until the packet is going up to the tunnel destination, V4 headers on the packet will be used for the routing. And then when the packet arrives on the destination side of the tunnel, then the tunnel destination will strip out V4 header and then bring V6 packet and deliver the V6 packet natively either to the servers on the network or probably other uh, routers for the routing in native V6 packet. Okay. So in tunneling, uh, tunneling can be classified into uh, three category. Number one is manually configured tunnel, right? So in manually configured tunnel, what we need to do, we need to specify tunnel source and tunnel destination on both sides of the tunnel, tunnel source and tunnel destination. And if you can see in the internet environment, there are hundreds of thousands of networks probably around and how come we can create tunnel source and tunnel destination to the hundreds of networks, right? It's practically it's not possible, it's not scalable approach. Manual tunneling can be possible in between two, three sites or probably as long as you can scale number of sites. Semi-automatic tunnel, what is that? Well, we will create tunnel source manually, tunnel destination manually, right? From both sides. But as a tunnel destination, we are not specifying to the end users. What we are specifying? We are specifying up to a gateway, right? Where all the other sides of the tunnel will terminate it. So for example, it will be a hub and spoke side of topology. So uh, hub side is a tunnel gateway, right? Like Hurricane, very popular nowadays for that purpose. So we just create one tunnel up to the tunnel broker, right? And then all the other network, instead of they come and create tunnel directly with me, they'll go and connect with the half side. So when is the tunnel is creating with the half side, then the other part of the tunnel is automatically there, right? So, they, so this is how semi-automated tunnel can scale in a bigger environment. And then the finally automatic tunnel. In automatic tunnel, what we do? Tunnel source, we only specify. Tunnel destination, we don't specify. The protocol itself, who is doing the automatic tunneling, for example, 6RD or 624, they will discover tunnel destination by themselves, right? It's very intelligent approach. They will dis discover the tunnel destination address by themselves. So when they will discover the tunnel destination address by themselves, then they can create individual packet to go to the particular tunnel destination. Okay, so this is what three category of the tunnel that we have manually configured tunnel semi automatic tunnel and automatic tunnel let's see uh, all those type of three types of tunnels okay it will be easy if we bring uh, a graphical diagram to show you the tunneling so as you can see in this diagram we have our v6 network here on the other side, we have V6 network. In the middle, we have IPv4 network, right? So this is what our tunnel source side router, tunnel destination side router. So for the tunnel source and destination, both the routers, they have to be dual stack, right? Because they will be interfacing, one side is IPv4, other side is IPv6. So they have to be dual stack. So in the dual stack router, you will create the tunnel. It means we'll create IPv4 header on top of V6 header so that as long as the packet is going across the v4 network ipv4 header will be used for routing right let's see in the next slide so in this tunneling process there are uh, two steps what step on the tunnel source side there has to be an encapsulation right 
in the encapsulation as i said what the source uh, of the tunnel router is doing they will do an encapsulation what encapsulation on top of v6 packet they will add a v4 header right and then when the packet goes to the other side of the tunnel which is tunnel destination side so what the tunnel destination side router will do they will do the decapsulation process what is decapsulation process in decapsulation process they will strip out ipv4 header from there right so then when they will strip out ipv4 header from there then there will be ipv6 packet only that ipv6 packet they can deliver natively okay so as i said right on the tunnel source side the encapsulation process v6 header arrive on the routers when it arrives the router will add v4 header here and this v4 header will be used for the routing all the way up to the tunnel destination side and tunnel destination side when it when uh, the destination side router will do the decapsulation process what it will do it will just strip off the v4 header then v6 header can be delivered natively okay let's have a look uh, the configuration that we need to do for manual tunneling so <laughs> we have uh, our dual stack router here and on the dual stack router our ipv4 address is 192.168.99.1 and v6 address is 2001db8c18 colon 1 colon colon 3 and on the other side of the tunnel which is the destination side ip address is 192.168.30.1 it means from this router to that router ipv4 address doesn't matter right it depending on their network topology what address in ipv4 they have right as long as from this router to that router they can ping on v4 right if the reachabilities are there on v4 they are ready to create the tunnel right so when they are ready to create the tunnel as long as both the router can ping each other then uh, we need to create the interface tunnel zero and when we create the interface tunnel zero it looks like from this router to that router there will be a sort of virtual point to point link even though there are a number of routers in ipv4 network but when you create the tunnel it means there will be a virtual point to point link in between tunnel source and destination right since it is a virtual point to point link in between tunnel source and destination that virtual point to point link need to share the same subnet in ipv6 need to share the same subnet in ipv6 that's what we're having here ipv6 slash 64 colon colon 3 in this side slash 64 colon colon 2 is in this side right they belongs to the same subnet but v4 completely two different ip address they doesn't need to belong to the same subnet because as long as they are reachable via the routing that's fine then what we did we specify tunnel source is this ip address 192.168.99.1 tunnel destination is 192.168.30.1 on the other side and what will be the tunnel encapsulation protocol tunnel mode ipv6 ip right make sense so this is what the configuration in this side what is the configuration on the other side same configuration right probably tunnel source and destination are vice versa All right, so this is what a configuration for a tunnel, manual tunnel. So when you create that, right, then you will see tunnel zero is up on this side, tunnel zero is also up on the other side. Now, if you ping from here to the IPv6 address on the other side, then you can ping. So this is what we call V6 packet is going via IPv4 network. Okay, so that's what we have uh, discussed about manual tunnel now we'll discuss about automatic tunnel as i said in automatic tunnel how the automatic tunneling works the definition of automatic tunneling is we only specify tunnel source but tunnel destination will be discovered automatically right from somewhere how it will work okay say for example in this diagram if this side of the network create a v6 packet this side of the network create a v6 packet 
when they create a v6 packet on the v6 packet header definitely we will have packet source in ipv6 and packet destination in ipv6 on this side right when this packet comes to this router right what this router can do this router doesn't know in ipv4 where the packet will go the router will only know in ipv6 where the packet is going because on the v6 packet tunnel is yeah, I mean packet destination address is there if we can build a mechanism in here or for this router to know the destination of the packet in ipv4 then our job is done this guy only know the destination in ipv6 if we can create a system in place so that tunnel destination can be included into v6 destination address then this router can read the tunnel destination ipv4 from the v6 header right how you can do that well if this guy they create their v6 address by incorporating their v4 address inside right so for example the gateway router just an example this gateway router is having <coughs> a loopback address in IPv4, right? Which is 32 bit. We convert that 32 bit IPv4 into hexadecimal, right? And then we put that 32 bit hexadecimal address into IPv6 address. Say, for example, for this site, if you can build a system, every site in the world, they will have 16 bit. IPv6 address common which is 2002 16-bit IPv6 address common 2002 and then from their gateway routers loop back which is v4 convert into hexadecimal and pad it inside this 16-bit then how many bit all together I will have 16-bit plus 32-bit encoded v4 address which is 48-bit site address if you can have the 48-bit site address then if you build an internet routing on that 48 bit site address in here then on the other side when we have the ipv6 packet on the tunnel on sorry on the packet destination whatever the address we have the tunnel destination is already inside from bit 17 up to bit 48 yes or no probably yes and then when he will create the packet for every packet they will use that ipv4 address which is hidden inside as a tunnel destination All right let's have a look at the configuration what we did we are configuring that's what we call 624 uh, address right where v4 address is inside v6 address this 624 concept is already replicated right but we still use this as an example to make you understand the automatic tunneling concept how v4 address can be hidden inside v6 right so this is how all those routers they can find out the v4 address from the v6 address and that can be used as a tunnel destination if you can see the configurations tunnel 0 ipv6 unnumbered with the tunnel 0 tunnel sources look back and there is no tunnel destination but what we did tunnel mode ipv6 ip624 right and then we add a static route ipv6 route 2002 colon colon through tunnel 0 what does it mean it means any v6 packet which is belongs to this range 2002 colon colon slash 16 we will go via tunnel 0 when it's going via tunnel 0 then it will reference to 624 and then it knows the tunnel source and then from the destination address on the v6 packet they'll bring out bit 17 up to bit 48 address and put it as a tunnel destination that's what we call automatic tunneling makes sense any question about automatic tunneling from the participants If not, then you can move on. <laughs> 624 relay, right? This is what another technology, tunneling technology. <laughs> what is 624 relay? In 624 technology, in the previous slide, what we saw, the tunneling is only possible between 624 side, right? Only 624 side. But what about native side? If you need to go to any native side, can we create any automatic tunnel? Probably not, right? So that's why for the native site connectivity, 
through the 624. There is a concept called 624 relay. What is 624 relay? Okay, all those IPv6 networks around the world who are connected to the native IPv6 network, they can, if they want, be a relay for that. How the relay works? Well, for the relay operation, there is a special IPv4 address which is 192.168.99. Dot, no, sorry, uh, 192.88.99.0. This is the address, special address. 192.88.99.0 in IPv4 for the any cast. So what it will do? All IPv6 native connected network like this one, they will use that special address to do the any cast. So if in the world there are 10, 20, 30, or 500 ISPs who has got native connectivity to the IPv6 world, they all can use the same special address 192.88.99.0 address and start advertising the whole slash 24 from their routers, right? So that from the other side, if I am the source, if I need to go to any native v6 site, I'll try to find out the nearest relay router because the same IP address in v4 is used as an anycast address. So when it is advertised as an anycast, the source side, they can find out the nearest relay servers in IPv4, right? And then what on their side they're supposed to do, they'll just add one more static route like this. IPv6 route, default route via this. What does that mean? It means that anycast address is incorporated inside here. That is used as a next stop for the default route. And then it going via 2002, then it will have a reference here to 2002 tunnel 0. And then in tunnel 0, we use 624. So when in this case, they will create the packet and they will first check on here and then they will find the next stop and on the next stop they will go via 624. On the 624 they will bring out 32 bit IPv4 tunnel destination from here and add it into the packet. So this is how this packet can be transferred to native network via the relay. Okay. So this is what the configuration on the relay routers. Same configuration as 624. The exception is you need to advertise IPv4 anycast address from BGP, right? And then uh, you have to add a static route for the default in IPv6. 6RD tunnel, same as uh, 624. The difference is the address structure. 6RD tunneling we use to send traffic uh, via the ISP infrastructure where some key component of the ISP infrastructure infrastructure doesn't support IPv6. Say for example, our uh, authentication server, right? So if I see this diagram, this is what uh, the customer network, ISP backbone, and this is what the internet, right? So in the ISP backbone, there are some devices in here that doesn't support IPv6. Only that support IPv4. Probably your gateway, or sorry, your authentication, or your PPP, or your server, or your BDAS. And if you need to upgrade that, there are lots of money involved. So for the time being, what we can do? Communication between your customer network up to your IPv6RD relay server, we use V4 transport. So through the V4 transport from the customer side, packet will come up to the relay router, or uh, sorry, 6RD router. On the 6RD router, the packet will be decapsulated, and from there, natively the packet can go outside. The return traffic come via uh, come all the way up to the 6RD relay routers in native, and then from here they will create a tunnel up to the destination and send the packet. This is how tunnel can be scalable, right? And in this 6RD tunneling mechanism, what we are doing, we are not using the 624 address, special address, but we are using ISPs 
IPv6 prefix, which is this, given by the registry, which is 32 bit. And then to calculate 48 bit site address, we can incorporate only the host part of the V4 address, not the network part, because network part will all be same. And when the routing will be happening, or tunnel will be creating, or tunnel destination will be creating in between 6RD, and, sorry, 6RD relay routers and customer 6RD router, Network address for all the customer will be same in V4, right? Because it's within the ISPs. Only the host part will be different. So only host part will incorporate within the IPv6 address. And this is how we'll give IPv6 site address to each customer. Okay. So 6RD is uh, useful uh, uh, transition technology that currently service provider they are adopting. And manual tunnel nowadays probably people use only for the testing purpose and in the real uh, commercial environment manual tunnel probably not that scalable okay finally the tunnel brokers in tunnel broker uh, what we can do or how it works for example hurricane is one of the popular tunnel broker you can create the tunnel all the way up to their routers and for that they have a website from the website you can configure your tunnel source and tunnel destination when it is created then all the configuration will be uploaded to their routers right and then when you create that you can choose the nearest router that you have when the tunnel is created between your machine and the tunnel broker then only this part will be through tunnel and from the other side to the customer end uh, probably destination side it can be via native or it can be via another tunnel okay so that is what the concept of tunnel broker transition strategies what are the strategies that we can uh, use well one is obviously doing nothing and that is not any strategy anyway so what we can do we can use NAT right NAT is a transition te technique not to adopt IPv6 probably but to extend the life of your v4 protocol right and obviously NAT is vendor specific and that costs lots of money. Few more transition technologies that are used in telco environment, for example, 646 XLAT, IVI, NAT 624, right? 6RD as well. Some transition technology terms that I have already explained today, which is dual stack, IP in IP tunnel, address family translation. What is the address family translation? Address family translation means translating from one address family to the other address family. In IPv6 transition, right, all the address family trans, uh, translation are from V4 protocol to V6 protocol and vice versa. Right, and NAT is different. NAT is IPv4 to IPv4, but that is not a transition technology for IPv6. IPv6 transition technology as an address family translation is from v4 to v6 and v6 to v4. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation for today. We try to cover those basic concepts of transition and we try to give you some uh, general category of uh, transition techniques and some uh, real transition uh, transible transition technology that can be used nowadays if i can summarize we start with uh, the concept of transition what uh, transition technique is what is the scenarios right we have covered a uh, uh, three working group that we have in itf then we discuss about uh, three transition technologies like dual stack, tunnel and translation. Within uh, tunneling, uh, we saw three more category, manual tunnel, uh, semi-automatic tunnel and automatic tunnel. As a definition, what we saw, manual tunnel is we need to specify both tunnel source and tunnel destination. In automatic tunnel, we only specify tunnel source, tunnel destination is discovered automatically. And in automatic tunneling section, we saw different different transition techniques or tunneling technique for example 624 624 relay 6rd 
646 XLAT, IVI, lots of transition technologies that we have nowadays. Okay, so that's just the beginning as a concept of transition. In future, we'll try to incorporate uh, more detail uh, discussion on individual transition technologies. Probably in future, you can do that. But at this stage, that's the end of the presentation. And if you have uh, any comments, any suggestion, as I said, you can go back to the, uh, you can uh, visit that URL. Just give us some feedback, very quick feedback, and then that feedback URL will redirect you to an FTP site. From there, you can download the presentation. I'll just uh, type that URL for you. All right, so there's the URL that you can use to give us some feedback and then it will redirect you to an FTP site. From there, you can download the presentation materials. So was there any question by any chance? All right, then if no question, uh, Well, if you still have any question, you can send email. Uh, I mean, still have any question after you uh, go through the presentation slide, you can send us email. Uh, our email address is training dot uh, Sorry, training at apnic.net. We'll try to sort of answer your question, and alternatively, you can come to our help desk, help desk at apnic.net, uh, or uh, in our uh, online web chat. to interact with Epnic Help Desk staff about any other question that you have about Epnic. All right, so this is what an URL that you can use as a reference, IPv6 at Epnic. This website has got lots of information about uh, transition technologies. Just come to www.epnic.net, then you go to community, under community you will see IPv6 at Epnic. And this website has got lots of information, useful information about the transition techniques from V4 to V6. So that is our help desk uh, URL. Just come to www.apnic.net under service, you'll go to help desk, then you'll see our help desk uh, chat box. You can talk to our help desk staff if you have any further questions. Thank you very much. Hope the session will be useful for you. And if you're interested to attend any of our other e-learning session, as you know, every Wednesday we do the e-learning in four slots. Just keep your eye on on the training at uh, so training.apening.net website and look at the schedule and register any of the uh, session that you are interested. Uh, thank you very much for today. Hope to see you in our future e-learning session.